Well, I can tell uh, who isn't uh, local uh, because the local people aren't here. It's a snow emergency out there, if you didn't notice. It's almost sticking to the pavement. Uh, so uh, DC is paralyzed. I don't know if they've shut down the government yet, but uh, I'm here. Anyway, uh, well, thank you uh, for being here from uh, all around the country. Uh, it's really important that you're here uh, to put a personal face on uh, the needs of, of your states uh, to your representatives uh, and your senators. Uh, you know, this is uh, long overdue to make uh, a major new uh, and more robust investment in our service transportation system in this country. When uh, the Democrats took over the House back in 06 and 07, uh, I chaired the, uh, the subcommittee, and we began uh, to uh, work on a very, very robust uh, authorization. Uh, uh, Chairman Oberstar and I were looking at, uh, we were hoping for <clears throat> well over uh, $400 billion uh, for uh, an authorization. Uh, we were looking for new revenue sources. Uh, and I was looking to write uh, a 21st century uh, transportation policy uh, to move us uh, beyond the legacy of the Eisenhower era, which we have sort of built on, but we haven't evolved uh, from uh, totally. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, wasn't uh, to be after the uh, election of the Obama administration. The, uh, we were in an economic crisis, and they brought forward something they called the American Something and Recovery Act, uh, ARA, uh, otherwise known as the stimulus. And uh, I, you know, the House version had a fair amount of infrastructure in it. Uh, the ultimate deal replaced infrastructure with a bunch of useless tax cuts, thanks to a guy named Larry Summers, uh, who thought that, you know, uh, as Larry said in a Democratic caucus, uh, this is going to be great. It's not going to be like George Bush. We're not going to send people a check. We're going to give them all tax cuts so small they don't notice. And I stood up and I said, gee, Larry, that's really great. So that's bad politics and bad economics. Uh, bad politics, they don't know they got a tax cut, and bad economics because uh, how are you going to put people back to work with a $12 a week tax cut? Uh, you know, we're not going to build any roads, bridges, highways, transit systems, uh, or deal with uh, many other crises. Then I went up to talk to this guy, Jason Furman, because he was new uh, with Obama, and I said, hey, you know, really, uh, we, we need a big infrastructure investment uh, as part of this bill. You've got to really put people back to work. It's the most immediate pe way to put people back to work. I said, you know, and for instance, I said, you know, just look at, uh, you know, the Corps of Engineers. I said, they have a, you know, $50 billion critical unmet needs backlog. Dams are crumbling, locks, et cetera. And he says, yeah, thanks to people like you, we're putting $4 billion into the Corps of Engineers. So basically, the Obama people hated uh, infrastructure. They thought it was old school. And they didn't want to go there. The president kept talking about it like we were doing it. And then the public became skeptical because they say, hey, you did it. You borrowed $800 billion, and you did your big infrastructure thing. And how many people put to work? And I said, well, the money invested in infrastructure put more people to work than $340 billion in tax cuts that didn't put anybody back to work. They said, what are you talking about? I said, at the most optimistic uh, you know, interpretation of what means infrastructure, 7% of that bill was invested in infrastructure, about 4 in surface transportation infrastructure. Um, I then went to uh, Chairman Oberstar, and I tried to get him to vote the committee uh, against the bill. Uh, but he wouldn't do that because he said, well, they promised me the next thing will be a, a big service transportation bill, and God rest Jim's soul. But I said, Jim, you know, you've been here longer than me, but you know what, I've learned in D.C. And he said, what's that? I said, the next thing never happens, and it didn't. Uh, you know, the Obama administration pulled the rug out from under the surface bill, and uh, here we are. Basically, we had, uh, you know, a placeholder with MAP 21, uh, but, you know, here we are uh, seven years later, uh, hopefully, finally, on a path uh, to a major uh, investment in a six-year service transportation bill. We are hung up mostly on revenues. Uh, Chairman Schuster and I, I could work out any policy differences. He isn't going to get on the John Micah path of saying we're going to zero out transit. I mean, you know, we may fight over the share that goes to transit. That was a major, major issue of contention uh, in the last real bill we did, 06, Safety Lou. Uh, and, 
you know, there, there'll be minor policy issues uh, that, that we'll deal with, but we're, we're pretty much on the same page and we can work all that out. Uh, the problem is we don't do the financing. Uh, that has to come out of the Ways and Means Committee, and, uh, you know, I put forward a number of ideas. Uh, back, uh, you know, because Obama wouldn't go with an increase in the gas tax uh, because of his pledge not to raise taxes on people who earn less than 250000 I said, okay, well, how about just indexing the gas tax to construction cost inflation, fleet fuel economy, and then project that income, bond it, and put it in the trust fund, takes care of a six-year bill. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was, uh, Ray, Ray LaHood really liked the idea. They ran the numbers uh, a number of years ago when, uh, when interest rates were even lower than today, but it turned out with the projected construction cost inflation and fleet fuel economy, gas would have gone up between 1.4 cents a gallon and 1.7 cents a gallon a year. And had you borrowed um, and dedicated that to borrowing, at that time with the really low interest rates, we could have borrowed $140 billion, put it into the trust fund at the beginning of the bill and paid it off in 12 years. I uh, haven't had those numbers run again, but it wouldn't be too much different. Uh, probably you'd be looking at about the same factor in terms of the increase in a gallon of gas. Uh, it would probably take 17 years to pay it back today. But you're not alienating the existing gas tax. You're not precluding future options. You're just, you would just be using that increment for that period of time. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I've talked to Paul Ryan about that, and his position is that's a tax increase. And I said, Paul, it's just maintaining the current value of money in terms of purchasing power. He said, no, no, that's a tax increase. So I say, so, okay, so how are you going to do it? He says, well, we're going to do tax reform. You're going to do tax reform by the May 31st uh, with a mandatory repatriation, which, you know, this, if you do voluntary repatriation, it actually loses money. Uh, if you do mandatory repatriation and assess taxes on the overseas money, which the Obama administration has proposed, it makes money, but the Republicans hate that idea, so we're not going to do that. It would be voluntary, which means one little blip of money, and then after that it loses money. Uh, so even if that could get done by the end of May, which it can't, uh, that's not realistic. And besides that, the deadline for many of you is coming much, much quicker uh, than, uh, than the end of May. Uh, you know, we've already had a few states say uh, we're postponing or canceling projects for this summer because of the uncertainty of the federal funds. Uh, I've got a, a spiffy uh, chart here. It just uh, shows the percentage dependence uh, of the states on, uh, on federal funds. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we've got uh, a number of states that are more than 70% dependent upon federal revenue a whole bunch of states between 50 and 69, and then uh, a lesser number, 35 to 49. But even 35 or so is not insignificant uh, if you're looking at that dropping essentially to zero uh, beginning on the 1st of July, which is the impact that'll happen if we don't come up with a new bill and new funding, or at least some temporary funding to get us through, because the trust fund balance will be down to the point where uh, we will not be allowed to disperse new funds and you will all get notices about the delay in your reimbursement and there will be no new commitments uh, for 10 to 12 months uh, while we spend our way out of the hole paying for past projects and then you will have a much diminished program going forward. That's what will happen if we do nothing. Uh, so nothing is not uh, an option and that's uh, in part why you're here in Washington this week and in part why I'm talking to you. Uh, you've got to carry this message. I can talk to your representatives, uh, but I don't get to vote in your state. Uh, and uh, they think, you know, I'm kind of prejudiced on this issue, that I'm just a Democrat and I just want to raise taxes and whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but we, we have to have uh, additional revenue. I'm not locked into anything. Uh, trying to uh, get through to the other side, I said, okay, how about a different idea? Let's, um, let's do away with the retail gas tax. It's gone. You can go home and say, I did away with the federal gas tax. That's great. And instead, we would impose a tax on the fraction of a barrel of oil that goes into taxable transportation uses. Uh, and in, in the, under the plan uh, that I put forward, actually the first year, even if the oil companies and OPEC and everybody could pass through every penny of that tax, uh, you would still see a slight decrease because it, the first year would actually be less than the 18.3 cents equivalent. But it would grow after that because it's indexed, and it would raise an extra 100 uh, to $110 billion over uh, the life of a six-year bill. Not a total solution, but not bad. 
uh, when you're looking at this. The nice thing is we have a study from the RAND Corporation that says, you know, actually, because of the way markets work, um, you know, with, with oil, they might not be able to pass through all the costs to the consumers. And they're estimating that it's, you know, 7 to 8 percent of that tax might be borne by the oil industry, which would not be a bad effect. Uh, so, uh, you know, I put forward uh, that idea, Earl Blumenauer has put forward straight up gas tax, five cents a year uh, uh, for three years. Um, I understand, uh, you know, there have been a couple of senators who proposed something on a gas tax. Uh, Tom Carper is working on an idea with a gas tax increase, but it could be offset if some of these imaginary revenues from repatriation or something else show up later, what we would offset the gas tax. Uh, but uh, he's not banking on it. So that's, that's the, uh, the major crux here. Uh, before, before this year, or before recently, I would have been here talking about this, devolution. Uh, because uh, for a little while, there was an awful lot of talk, particularly after the Republicans took over the House, about devolution. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a, a cockamamie theory, uh, and, uh, you know, it has subscribers. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the right-wing think tanks think it's a great idea. Uh, there are probably 40 or 50 uh, Republicans in the House who really believe uh, that this is the way to go. I do mention to them that, you know, it is, you know, it's one of the few things in the Constitution, you know, that roads, postal roads, that, you know, it is authorized by the Constitution. Uh, we are a nation. We do need to be knit together. And they say, well, this is a great new idea. We give the states all the flexibility to do it, and they'll all work together. I said, well, you know, actually, we tried that. It's not a new idea. And they went, what? What do you mean it's not a new idea? I said, it's not a new idea. Look at this. There's the photograph. Use this on the floor many times and in a lot of speeches. That's an aerial photograph, Life magazine. And yeah, have a look at it and you puzzle. Well, what is that? Well, that's the brand new Kansas Turnpike. Kansas and Oklahoma had a deal. Oklahoma was going to build the Turnpike. Kansas is going to build the Turnpike. Well, Kansas built the turnpike, Oklahoma got into financial difficulties, they didn't build the turnpike. So for a number of years, uh, this is uh, what they had. Uh, that's Amos Schweitzer's farm field there. Uh, and uh, Amos was a very nice guy. He towed a lot of trucks and cars out of his field. Because uh, they, I mean, they put up barriers, people crashed through them. I mean, hey, you're on the new turnpike, you're going for it, and bam, you know. So. Um, you know, and Oklahoma didn't build their section until the federal government came along with a national highway program and, re and shared uh, the costs uh, with Oklahoma. I said, so if it didn't work in 1956, how do you think it's going to work in the 21st century when we're competing with countries that are putting 9% of their gross domestic product into their transportation infrastructure? Or India, 6%. Or Brazil, 5%. How do you think we're going to compete with these countries when they can so much more efficiently move goods and people? And by the way, in the process of creating that system, they're employing a hell of a lot of people and they have a more robust economy. Uh, don't you think uh, we need to do that here uh, to be competitive? And the answer from, uh, you know, from my side is clearly yes, absolutely. Uh, we do need uh, that robust national program. Well, the good news is that uh, one of the originators who still serves in Congress, uh, early proponents of devolution, is Jim Inhofe, when he was a House member. Uh, he and I served together for a number of years. And uh, Jim and uh, I think it was Connie Mack uh, came up with the theory of devolution. Well, uh, this week, in fact, yesterday, uh, Chairman Inhofe of the EPW committee said, it doesn't work. He said it was a fun idea at the time. It doesn't work. It won't work. We need uh, a national program. Uh, so I'm pleased to be here uh, before you today to say, I mean, you might still run into, there's probably, you're going to still, some of you from some states are going to still hear from some devolutionists. Uh, but you can tell them, no, not going to happen. Chairman, neither chairman supports that idea. Uh, and we need a, a national program, and then go on from there to explain to them uh, why we need uh, a national program uh, to be competitive uh, in the world economy. You know, I used to, I, I go around giving these speeches a lot, and Earl Blumenauer is in the audience in one, and <clears throat> I would go, and I'm not going to bore you with statistics because you know them better than I do, 
about the number of bridges that you know um, are either functionally obsolete or actually structurally deficient that need repair or replacement, the pavement conditions, the huge backlog in transit. I mean, I do go around saying, you know, now bad that it is with transit, we're actually killing people in the nation's capital uh, because of a lack of investment in our transit system here, outdated equipment, uh, killing people. Now that's an embarrassment. Uh, but um, so I would take to calling us, uh, you know, becoming a third world country in terms of infrastructure. And after one of these speeches, uh, I, you know, I'm walking out and Blumenauer says, well, that was a good speech, he said, except uh, he said that was really insulting. And I said, what, what was insulting? And he said, because you said we were third world. And I said, like, Earl, come on. I mean, you know how bad things are. He says, no. He says it was insulting to third world countries because they are putting a larger percentage of their gross domestic product into transportation infrastructure than we are, and that's true. Uh, we're at the bottom. I mean, we're something, you know, we're way down there. I saw a chart once. We were like 89th in the world. We were competing with Zimbabwe in terms of the percent of our GDP going into transportation infrastructure. I haven't been able to find a, a more recent chart or replicated chart, but it is, you know, we're about 1%. Uh, and try and find any other major industrial country that's putting as little in as 1%. Uh, and you get an idea of what's going on here. We just need to change the mindset. This is investment. It has always been bipartisan. Uh, it's about moving goods and people efficiently uh, in this country. It's about linking the 50 states and the territories together and connecting us to the world. Uh, and it's something that we should all be able to come together on. There's a, some interesting, uh, I became privy to some interesting uh, focus group and polling that was done recently on the issue, and you can, you know, I can't quote it exactly because it's a confidential stuff, but the bottom line is this group went into the reddest congressional districts in the United States of America, the reddest of the red districts, uh, where, you know, I mean, you, you know, uh, they don't have Democrats. And uh, they explained, uh, you know, the current state of affairs, 18, you know, 18.3 cent gas tax, 18.4 cents hadn't been raised in 21 years, explained the condition of the, the system. And 63% and of those hard red uh, voters said they would support an increase in the federal gas tax to deal with those problems. Now, part of the problem, I think, is the stupidity of doing away with earmarks. Uh, that's not gonna get undone, but let me just explain for anybody who hears about that. I reformed them in my proposed bill uh, to, you know, we had a few earmarks that got in one or two that no one had seen and one that was uh, overly expensive and didn't have a good cost-benefit ratio. Uh, in, uh, in Safety Lou got huge national press and then it became a campaign issue and so on and so forth. Well. Uh, first off, it was a very small percentage uh, of the bill that went into, uh, into congressionally designated priorities. Uh, they weren't really earmarks, and earmark is when you don't have any authorization under law and you put money into it. So first off, they weren't even earmarks. But secondly, uh, you know, they were, for the most part, very beneficial projects that were locally focused. And um, what I said is, well, we, we can improve on that. So when I was writing the bill, I said, all right, if you want earmarks, everybody's gonna submit them by this date. You have to show you've got uh, support uh, you know, at home uh, from you know, your MPOs, your local communities, your counties, your state. Uh, you know, it fits into uh, your STIP. You can't have any interest in it. And we're gonna put them all on the internet. They all will be posted there. Uh, for anybody and everybody to root through and find anything that's abusive and comment on it. Now we had 10 times as many as we ever would have funded uh, with what we were looking at. Um, there were very few members who did not submit, uh, including both sides of the aisle, and there was never ever a peep or a trace of a scandal, and that was up from when I started uh, writing the bill, I think we put those up in May until we lost the House uh, a year that next November. Uh, so we reformed them. Uh, you know, there are a number of people on the Republican side who'd like to bring them back. That would help us. Because if you can go home and say, well, I'm going to raise your gas tax or I'm going to do this for taxes, but here's what's going to happen here. Uh, people go, oh, okay. You say, well, I'm going to raise the gas tax and I'm going to give it to Obama. They're like, what? What are you talking about? Or I'm going to send it to the state capital, you know, and the state share. Some people think they're, their priorities in their part of the state don't get met. Uh, so, um, 
you know, it's a really big selling point for individual members uh, of Congress. We might try some kind of workaround. We did a workaround that isn't working so well in the Water Resources Development Act, which was probably the only significant and productive bill passed by the last Congress. Uh, but um, we put in there that local communities, states, whatever entities would submit projects and then the Corps of Engineers would vet them and then they would submit a recommendation to Congress. But the Corps being the Corps has disqualified like 99% of the projects up front. So uh, that hasn't worked out so well. We're kind of trying to figure out how we're going to uh, jiggle that a little bit to make that into a more useful way to maybe getting back around to doing some local, uh, local priorities. Uh, but uh, right now we don't have that. So you're the ones that have to bring it home. You've got to bring it home to these members of Congress. You've got to bring it home in your states. This is what we could do with this additional investment. This is what it's going to mean in your daily commuting life. This is what it's going to mean for your business. This is what it's going to mean, you know, in terms of safety. Uh, you know, whatever kind of advocacy or position people have, you can make a case to them, and we've got to make that case. We've got to get this back to the grassroots level. I know the American people are there, but we've got to get them a little more invested in it and a little more excited about it and get them to push their members of Congress so we can get over this hump, get the funding we need, uh, and do a robust bill. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.